Hey everybody, it's Natalie from Power Moon Tarot. Today I'm going to be talking about the astrology of Andre the Giant and just one moment here while I get everything set up. And thank you so much for being here. Ah, muffins and mega pints. You've been watching WrestleMania all day and he is a favorite for sure. Nice guy from everything I know. Yes, I totally agree with you, muffin and mega pints. Um, everything I've done on Andre the Giant as well indicates to me that um, he's a very nice guy. So we have the pleasure of talking about him today. And the title of the webcast is The Gentle Giant, The Astrology of Andre the Giant. And um, yeah, WrestleMania was a huge thing. Um, I don't know if it's still a huge thing right now because I don't, I haven't seen, I don't usually watch like live television anymore, but like, um, you know, back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, like WrestleMania was a huge thing for those of you that grew up, you know, around Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, Jake the Snake, um, who were all the ones, like there were so many of them and um, like there's just, yeah, and they were all different characters and um, they were involved in, like they would get in and do these wrestling um, shows and a lot of it was showmanship and a lot of it was scripted but also people like really enjoyed it because it was fun and it was kind of soap opera ish in a way and the wrestlers would like have these feuds and things like that and um, but anyway it was pretty cool and um, muffins and mega pints says that um, it is, but it's only for fans, not like me, not like it was for me, but a two-day event now um, always sells out. Oh, interesting. Okay. So it's still, um, but it, not like it was, but it's a two-day event now and it always sells out. Yeah, like people really get into um, the whole like WrestleMania. And what people don't understand, I think, too, about WrestleMania is that the um, wrestlers can actually get hurt, too, because they are, like, falling on their backs and they are falling on other bodies and things like that. And so there actually is – it's not all, like, fake or scripted or whatever because they can actually get hurt. So um, – but anyway, I'm excited today to talk to you guys about Andre the Giant and um, – Andre, Andre the Giant um, was a French man who grew up, grew up in France and eventually moved over to the United States. And um, he was like, you know, probably the biggest guy out of all the guys that were wrestling at that time. Um, he stood over seven feet tall. At one point, he was over 500 pounds. And um, yeah, so huge, like massive guy. And he kind of put wrestling on the map because of his size. And so at one point he was like the highest paid wrestler and he was in the Guinness Book, Rec Guinness Book of World Records for being the highest paid wrestler like in the world. And he would go over all over Japan, the United States, um, Canada, like he would go all over the place, Europe like um, wrestling in different matches and then like showing up as a special attraction um, because of his side size and because he was actually a giant um, in stature. And so we're going to look at his Wikipedia page here in a met, minute. And uh, Muffins and Megapint says, um, oh yeah, and he was also. And Holly says, as you wish, Princess Bride. He did a wonderful job in the movie. Yes, Andre the Giant was also um, in the print in the movie Princess Bride, and that's an amazing movie. I think that that movie was from 1987, but it's a great movie if you guys haven't seen it. And Muffet and Megapints is saying, yes, it's not the same like it was. It was better when I was a kid, like most things. I hear you. Muffins and Megapints, yeah. Like, you know, rest, like Hulk Hogan, the whole match between Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant was like this huge thing during WrestleMania and people just going crazy over the dramas and the body slamming and it was a lot of fun. And Andre the Giant loved being a wrestler. Now, he was very unique. He was a very unique man. And I'm just going to show you guys another picture of him here. Here's a picture of him in his black um, leotard that he would always wear. He was born on May 19th in 1946 in France. 
He died at age 46 years old in 1993, which is pretty sad. Um, he died when he was only 46 years old. Um, and basically, like, he died of cardiac arrest because his heart gave out, and it was due to his giantism. So he actually did have um, a disease that was untreated when he was a child, and as a result, he grew to, like, this enormous heights, and his hands would be, like, way bigger than, like, a huge man's face. Like, he had... Um, like he could lift cars and he could lift like multiple people at the same time. Like he just had incredible strength and incredible size. And um, he really did kind of put professional wrestling back on the map. And um, as we know, like there's not so many people in the world that are actually like certified giants, like for real giants. And he was one of those and he did suffer from a disease. Um, that was the result of his pituitary gland producing too much excess growth hormone, which caused like his forehead to grow, his bones to grow. Um, and keep in mind, his bones had to support all this weight on his skeleton. And um, anyway, let's talk a little bit about him. So um, he was born in 1946 in a very small village in France. Um, and he's better known by his ring name, Andre the Giant. And um, he was actually dubbed the eighth wonder of the world. And he was known for his great size, which was, res was a result of giantism caused by excess human growth hormones. And um, this talks about his career as a wrestler and what he did, um, his early life, and talking about how he got... Uh, um, dropped out of school when he was 14 to like work on the family farm but then he got sick of it and went to go wrestle and then it goes through his whole wrestling career here and look at him he's in 1973 a local wrestling competition getting ready to body slam somebody there <laughs> and um yeah so it just talks about everything he's done there he is right there andre the giant look these guys are very big these this guy that he's wrestling but yet he still towers over him um there he is again in another wrestling photo and um he did have an acting career as we said he was in the princess bride this he was in a lot of others he was in other stuff too and this was um some of the things that he was in as far as movies go and um, it says here about his personal life that he was mentioned in the 1974 Guinness Book of World Records as the then highest paid wrestler in history. And he earned an annual salary of approximately 400000 which was equivalent to $2.4 million at this time. Um, he did end up having one child um, who he left his estate to. And... Um, Anyway, so it's really interesting. At one point, he did have a ranch in North Carolina, looked after by two of his close friends. Um, when he wasn't on the road, he loved spending time at his ranch in North Carolina. Um, a couple things about his health, which I will go into. A lot of people called him, he's been dubbed the greatest drunk on earth, and um, for once consuming 119 beers in a total of six hours. In an appearance with Late Night with David Letterman on January 23rd, 1984, he told Letterman he once drank 117 beers in one setting. Um, when Letterman asked if he was drunk, he said he couldn't remember because he passed out. He said he had also quit drinking beer at that time when he went on Letterman. So um, a lot of people think that he drank that much because of all the physical pain that he was in because of his giantism. And um, he did like food. He did like drink. He was a Taurus. The guy is the sun in Taurus, so we will talk about that. So he did love his food and his drink and all of that. But um, a lot of people state that the way that he drank, especially when he was wrestling a lot, was due to his physical pain um, that he was in. And all he says, he always had a beer on hand and a painkiller. Yeah, because, um, and people talked like before he would go out and wrestle, he would drink like five bottles of cognac and different stuff like that. It's like, whoa. Like, and it didn't affect him as much, obviously, because he, he weighs a lot more. But yeah, 115 beers, 116 beers, that is a lot of beers. And he would always invite all his friends out with him and like pay for them and um, take care of their tabs. He loved playing cards. 
you know, he was a really, a lot of people um, that talk about him say, like, what a wonderful guy he was. And um, anyway, and then it says here, at he died at age 46, sadly, of congestive heart failure and an apparent heart attack in his sleep. And it was due to his untreated giantism. And he was in Paris at the time at his dad's funeral when he passed. And um, he passed in his sleep, and then he ended up um, being cremated, and his ashes were spread around his North Carolina ranch. And so that is Andre the Giant. Now we're going to get into his chart here in a minute. I'm going to show you guys some photos of him too. So here's a, a book about him called The Eighth Wonder of the World, The True Story of Andre the Giant. And here's him, act, you know, they're acting and things for um, WrestleMania. And he's, look at how big his hands are. You guys, isn't that wild how big his hands are? Can like, oh, uh, they can totally palm around a guy's entire neck. And um, here he is here too, comparing his hand to like a normal man's hand. Look, um, yeah, just real big guy. And here he is holding a beer. Look how small that beer is in his hand compared to his hand. And um, here he is sitting on a flight. He always had to fly first class so he could, he would take up two seats. But other than that, he couldn't really fit on a plane. And if he wasn't in first class and taking up two seats like that. But, um, and he did travel all over the world, but he talked about staying in hotel rooms where the beds were too small. And he was in Japan a lot. Uh, for wrestling and of course the Japanese people are like much smaller and he would like especially compared to a giant they're much smaller and he would try to be fitting in the elevators he would try to be getting taxis like he couldn't fit into cars he couldn't fit into taxis that well um, you know he it was hard for him to travel all over the place but he did travel all the time uh, for wrestling and here's him and Hulk Hogan getting ready to do Wrestlemania 3 here where they were going to face off against each other and him and Hulk Hogan were actually friends you can see a photo of them there and Andre the Giant basically kind of passed his title over to Hulk Hogan um, to basically take everything over and here's Hogan in the ring and then Andre over here so um, here's Andre the Giant when he was in the movie The Princess Bride. For those of you that have seen Princess Bride, um, you'll recognize him from there. I thought this was a hilarious photo too, like him with holding up four women like that and um, lifting them without like even sweating at all. This looks like when he's younger too, so he looks thinner even maybe in this picture too. But yeah, he lifts up these four women and then... I threw in this photo of one of his best friends who used to travel around with him all the time and um, go drinking with him and stuff. And would it was his um, he his name is Tim White. He used to actually be a referee for um, the World Wide Wrestling Federation, and so he um, knew Andre the Giant because he was a referee. And then he became Andre's assistant, but it was also like his best friend too. And um, I got interested in doing Andre the Giant's chart because I saw a um, documentary of him. I think it was HBO, a documentary, I want to say. And um, I was like, do we have a time chart for him? Plus, because of his medical issues with giantism and being an actual giant, I was like, I'd really love to take a look at his chart and see what Jupiter is doing because when we think of a planet um, that is associated with being like really large or really huge, we think of Jupiter. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So immediately when I heard that he was like actually a real giant and, and had a disease that caused him to grow, like out of control grow like that, I was like, oh, it has to be Jupiter. And you guys will see when we look at his chart what is going on with Jupiter. Um, here's a picture of him and his friend again, um, younger Tim White that he used to travel around with. And there's just some more photos of him. Uh, here's another photo of him. And then I've got a surprise for you guys later with this last tab. So I'm not going to show you that last tab. But um, anyway, so let's go ahead and take a look at his chart. Time for the astrology. Now that you all know who Andre the Giant is. So I am going to go ahead and annotate the screen 
and get it moving. And feel free if you're in the chat to say hello, drop comments, whatever you like. I am going to um, bring up my thing as well here. And sorry about that, you guys. <laughs> Just one moment. And um, actually, you know what? I brought up the wrong thing. Let me bring this up. OK, perfect. So. Let me go ahead and we will get into his chart. Excited to have you here, guys, and let's do it. So Honor the Giant is a Libra rising. And um, as I mentioned, as I was like looking into his life and hearing stories about him, um, people were saying, and, ooh, I am a god 1982, asking if I could do Michael Jackson. Yeah, I can do Michael Jackson's chart. Um, I am a god 1982. Do we have a birth time for him? Do we have an accurate birth time? I'll have to check on that. Um, so I will check and see. If we have an accurate birth time for Michael Jackson, a public accurate birth time, I will definitely go ahead and take a look at that. And um, anyway, so with Andre the Giant, uh, everything I read about Andre the Giant was basically like people thought he was the nicest guy, like sweet, gentle, caring guy. And that's very, you know, Venusian of him to be like that as a Libra ri rising, very generous, always offering to pay for everyone, um, very sweet and caring. Like a lot of people said, like, yeah, he was a giant and he could be scary, like in the wrestling ring. But outside of that, he was like very tender and sweet and we can see that he has Neptune on his ascendant. Now, remember earlier when um, I mentioned that like he was called like the world's greatest drunk in the meeting where he could drink like 117 beers in like one sitting that um, basically like thank you I am a god 1982 thank you that's MJ's birthday Michael Jackson's birthday I'll just need to check his birth time before um, I can do his chart I'll need to look up and make sure he's got an accurate birth time um, but yeah, so, so Andre the Giant, you know, he was called the greatest, like drunk alive. And like we talked about, he would sometimes drink like five bottles of cognac before a match or, you know, drink like 117 beers in one sitting with his friends. Like, you know, he's got that Neptune rising. He also has the moon square Neptune too, which sometimes you see, um, especially if there's like family or inherited issues around alcohol or drinking, oftentimes you do see the moon Neptune, which we don't know too much about his family um, history or if there was a history of a lot of drinking in his family. Um, perhaps with the moon and Capricorn there too, perhaps battling depression, um, body pain, physical pain, bone pain, all of that, and using the alcohol to kind of numb that pain with the Neptune rising there. And um, I am a god 1982. It says 7.33 p.m. Okay, I'm going to check it too for MJ's birthday birth time. Um, I'm not going to be able to do his chart right now, but um, I'll definitely look into it for you, my friend. And um, I'll check too because what I really look at when I'm looking for birth times is I look on um, – I look at the Rodin rating to make sure which gives birth times like a, a grade basically it gives them like double A, A, B, C and it'll tell you like if it's a double A it's a really reliable birth time and that usually means that there is a public birth certificate with the birth time correct. Um, what's interesting is that there's like astrologers who go out and particularly um, and I think there's a rule that after you get to be 75 years old in some states, I think you can request a birth certificate for the person, even if you're not the actual person. Um, so some people, like, you just have to wait till they're old enough. I know. Um, oh, no, no, no. You're fine. Namaste, my friend. No, no. Don't worry about it. I was just kind of thinking about birth times and how important they are and things like that. Don't worry at all, my friend. Um, anyway, sorry to go on a tangent, <laughs> but um, anyway, so Andre the Giant, very gentle, very caring, and um, we can see, you know, Venus is the ruler of his ascendant. He's got Venus in Gemini at the top of his chart there, um, trying that Jupiter. 
so indeed like very generous very nice very kind he's got neptune on his ascendant you know generous likes to drink a lot you know likes to have a good time um started off as a kid in a very poor um immigrant village in france his parents were actually immigrants and he started off with like a dream of having a life different than just living on the farm or growing up on the farm and um so that's pretty cool but anyway so we've got the neptune there on his ascendant and we also have chiron there in his first house too um talking about you know the beauty and the pain because although he was very caring and very kind and very generous and all that he was in a lot of constant physical pain um, because of his disease now when i saw that he had jupiter in the first house i was like of course he has jupiter in the first house right he's a giant and um, the first house does have to do with you know our appearances our looks um, the first house also plays a lot in our like health and our uh, vitality our physical health and our appearance so the first house is very much a part of that and you know people that have jupiter rising are often seen as you know being very gregarious and generous and kind and fun and good-hearted and that is if they have positive aspects to their jupiter and their chart and i mean you have to look at the whole chart but um i can say you know for the people that i know that have jupiter rising they do come across as you know benevolent giving um but they tend to do everything really bigly and i have no bigly is not a word really but i do notice that it's interesting because my boyfriend has jupiter rising in his first house and um he is always like he is very sweet to me all the time always very nice caring um generous all of that but sometimes when he makes food he'll make like an insane amount of food and like give me a plate of food that is like 10 times bigger than my head and i'm like why is this such a huge plate of food or he'll go to the store and get treats for our dog and the bag of treats is humongous and bitter, like bigger than the dog's head, than my dog's head. He'll also sometimes, like he loves buying her toys, which again is very Jupiter, very generous, very kind and everything, but he'll buy her toys that are like bigger than her. And I think it's so funny because one time he bought her this huge fish. And, um, <laughs> and anyway, like this massive fish for her to play with for my dog and I'm like it's too big she can't even play with it so that's a very Jupiterian thing I just tell you guys that to know that um you know Jupiter is responsible for like largeness and bigness and doing everything like really big and um so the fact that he had Jupiter rising I was like of course you know he has Jupiter rising and um and muffins and mega pints asked is my boyfriend italian no no he's not italian he's um he's actually he's from detroit he's originally from detroit but his family he's got like um he's got native american and jewish both very interesting background that he has on his sides of the family one side negative american one side jewish so very interesting mix that he has going on there but yeah with the jupiter rising it's like oh my gosh it's like everything is like done so big and so when i saw that you know andre the giant had jupiter rising i'm like of course he's buying dinners for all his friends of course he's you know giving everyone money of course he's like you know but then there's the challenging aspect of that with the Sometimes Jupiter can represent overdoing things or, um, you know, but but also from a medical astrology perspective, Jupiter is associated um, with the human growth hormone, which is manufactured, um, sorry, which is manufactured by the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland in medical astrology is also associated with Jupiter along with the liver and um, jupiter is also associated with fat or gaining fat and so you know the fact that he was like over 500 pounds over seven seven uh seven feet four inches tall like huge 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 massive guy 
But, you know, the Chiron part of it, where we see Jupiter with Chiron, is very challenging um, because when he would go to, let me erase this stuff too so you guys can see better, but when he would go like in airports and would be walking around, like people would stare at him. They would just be like, who is, you know, little kids would point at him and laugh and people would like stare and point at him. And of course, Chiron represents where we're dealing with pain or a wound um, or something that's very abnormal or different. And, um, you know, it can sometimes even be something that makes us stand out from other people. And while he, you know, it's really interesting with him because he was able to make money and become this world famous wrestler because of his size. But at the same time, he was made fun of a lot and it really hurt his feelings and there's a quote from one of his friends that says um he would tell his friends like i see how people uh point at me and laugh at me and um and i don't like it you know like it hurts my feelings and um his friend made a quote that said a lot of people didn't realize like what a sensitive and like he was that he was a very very sensitive guy and um like very caring but also very sensitive and we see that with the neptune on the ascendant like very very sensitive about comments maybe about how he looks but also not really um showing people maybe sometimes how much it hurts his feelings because he is so um gentlemanly and and so socially gentlemen about him and that's very libra to be like if people are taking shots at you or people are acting weird towards you like not reacting to it or you know being very um pleasant and polite towards people even if they are treating you like in a mean way and um, being very like social and polite even if people are acting mean and so I think that we see that um yeah and the blissful oracle says i love him oh yes i andre the giant like he is very lovable um he has a very very deep voice if you guys have ever heard him talk to and he always calls everybody boss which i think is kind of funny too um and he probably realized that from an early age that maybe because he started growing at an early age i think when he was a teenager is when um, his pituitary gland really started like creating the growth hormone that really, really made him grow, grow, grow. And just probably the reaction from people that people were afraid of him made him be really nice to people. And um, Holly says it makes sense that he joined the modern day version of the traveling circus um, versus to monetize, right? And yeah, no, I totally to monetize um the gawking for his benefit yeah i totally agree with you like you know and i think his chart really does speak to that because the ruler of his ascendant is that venus and it's trying to jupiter but chiron is also that there too which tells me you know i'm making the best out of a painful situation or i'm making the best out of something that could be very painful or very physically challenging or hard yet I'm still doing the best that I can with my circumstances and and not just even doing the best that I can but actually succeeding and actually making money I mean Venus trying Jupiter also just talks about you know how many people loved him like people were like wow what a guy you know like they really like the guy and um, like socially even though probably men were intimidated by him look at the mars pluto conjunction in leo right which we are going to talk about that too um probably you know there were some men that were very intimidated around him but um i also think that he had a way of putting people at ease with that libra rising and he had a way of making people feel at ease in his company um probably because you know they if not they would be very scared of him and um are intimidated by him and one of his friends said that andre didn't like being alone you know like his whole family was back in france and he was in the u.s and he was always traveling everywhere away from his family away from his friends that he grew up with 
and um his friend said that he would always want like other people to go out with him go out drinking playing cards hanging out that he always wanted people around him and i think that that's also very libra rising too of like not wanting to be alone and wanting friends and wanting people around you know wanting to be social out playing cards like he loved playing like rummy and cribbage and all these kinds of games with friends and um the blissful oracle says libras are so charming yeah he had a very like charming nature to him and you know the fact that he has jupiter rising in his ascendant and he is a giant and he has that jupiter trying the venus his ruler of his ascendant um even if people did stare and gawk at him he still had a very positive impact overall and he still was a very positive person too on top of that and so um yeah so we're going to talk more about that venus trying jupiter and you know um that's also a really nice uh wealth signature as well particularly with the venus in the ninth house of destiny and good luck and all of that and and he did have an amazing destiny because he went from living in a poor immigrant village of like 30 people in France to becoming the top paid wrestler in the entire world. Um, so, I mean, whoa, talk about rags to riches. Talk about, you know, what a what a wild destiny that he has. And we can see that he has the ruler of his ascendant, that Venus is in a conjunction um, with Rahu or the North Node. So what a special destiny that he had indeed. And um, yeah, and Holly says, you know, friends and associates as a social buffer. Yeah, I totally agree, especially with the Libra there. Um, you know, having friends around him and having people around him as a social buffer. Because um, he said sometimes he would like walk into a, in a bar, an establishment to play cards with his friends or whatever. And people would just get scared and leave. But if he has people around him and everyone's being nice and friendly and everything, then it's more like he can fit in more if he has more people around him. And so, yeah, Holly, I really think that you are on to that um, and on to something with that. I, I think that's a very astute comment for sure about his friends kind of being a social buffer um, against that awkwardness and yeah of going into new places and people gawking and staring at him now um one thing i always look at in the chart too is the balance of the elements and his chart has a lot of air it has a ton of air and earth in it he's got the moon in capricorn he's got the mars in leo he's got some fire there but he only has one planet in water and that is the saturn in cancer which i also think I also think that, um, oh no, muffins and mega pints, you lost sound. Can everybody else he hear me okay? Let me see. Let me see. Everybody, is everybody okay? Can everyone hear? I can hear. I just played back. I can hear myself. Hopefully, you all can hear me. Um, oh, muffin pup. Oh, okay, Holly, you can hear. Good, good, good. Um, said to pop back pop out and come back in um oh thanks holly okay good i was getting worried <laughs> okay so the whole chart actually um has very little water in it and he does have saturn and cancer now saturn is debilitated in cancer but i also think what that says is it says that in his 10th house of career right saturn is developed develop, debilitated in cancer in the 10th house of his career and he has very little water in his chart as it is and i think that that says something about the price of success right and there's always a price with with saturn and part of his price i think was um like a lack maybe in connection and certainly a lack in family and as we know cancer is associated with you know our tribe our clan our village our family um, a sense of belonging in that and a sense of being connected and you know for him the big price that he had to pay um, in order to be successful was you know basically having a lack of that in his life and um, he also did have, and I think it was hard for him to form 
um, maybe, I mean, he was very social and he did have friends, but I think it was harder for him to keep those family ties and keep those deeper connections in play because he was also traveling 320 days out of the year. And so, I mean, he was constantly on the road, constantly traveling, um, and it's just hard. There is, I think, a lack of water in the chart, and Saturn debilitated there says something about, you know, the price of all of that and the price that he had to pay um, in order to be successful. Now, um, in the chart, this is a day chart as the sun is above the horizon. So um, Mars is going, or sorry, Jupiter is going to be the greatest benefic in the chart. And Mars is going to be um, the greatest malefic. And so Saturn is, is tough, but it's not as bad as Mars. And we'll see that later when we get to his medical astrology and how he died from a heart attack. Of course, you know, Mars in Leo and Leo is associated with the heart. So, you know, that is eventually kind of what did him in. Um, Saturn, also a malefic, is there too, and it is squaring his Jupiter, and we will talk about that more as we get on to the more medical astrology of it all. Um, but anyway, so I just wanted to go ahead and point out some interesting things in the chart before we get going um, even further. So one thing I noticed right away is that the moon is in Capricorn, okay? And the moon is in detriment in Capricorn. The moon is ruling his 10th house of career. It's squaring his ascendant, which basically says, I don't really get, because of my career, I don't get to see my family too much or that my family doesn't like my career they wish I was doing something different for my career we'll talk more about that a little bit later when it has to do with his family and his career because there's a lot of um, stuff there but before we get into that the moon is in Capricorn in detriment now notice that Saturn is in the moon sign and moon is in Saturn sign so Saturn would rather be in Capricorn and the moon would rather be in Cancer. So we call that a mutual reception. Now that mutual reception can also be helping that Saturn out a little bit there too, but technically, even if you notice the mutual reception there, technically they're not within orb of each other. Um, so I don't know that I would actually call that a mutual reception because they're not actually making a true aspect to one another. but. Um, I did find that interesting that the moon is in Saturn sign and Saturn is in the moon sign and the moon is ruling his 10th house of career and Saturn is ruling his fourth house of family. So we'll talk more about that later because that's a very interesting signature right there for him. And um, anyway, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. I just wanted to point that out. Also, I want to point out too, like I said, Saturn is debilitated in Cancer and it is squaring um, the Jupiter in Libra. But keep in mind, Saturn is exalted in Libra and Jupiter is exalted in Cancer. So the Jupiter and Saturn are in a mutual reception to each other. So even though Saturn is squaring that Jupiter, it's still getting some benefit um, as the Jupiter is in Saturn's exaltation. So um, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the medical astrology, but I just wanted to point out some of those technical things in the chart that I think are really going to become apparent later as we go on, okay? And let's go ahead and begin. So we kind of already began, but we're going to really, <laughs> really take it home now, okay? Okay. So I did mention um, that he did have a disease that caused him to be a giant. And I mentioned when we deal with Jupiter, we are dealing with, you know, bigness and largeness. And um, Jupiter is the biggest planet in our solar system. And actually, you can fit 1300 Earths inside of Jupiter. And Jupiter's diameter is 11 times wider than that of Earth. And... Um, so, I mean, Jupiter is huge. Like, it is a massive, massive planet. So when we talk about somebody being, you know, massive or large or having excess human growth hormone, as I talked about, we are talking about Jupiter. 
Um, Jupiter rules fat. It rules largeness, justice, optimism, having a carefree attitude, wealth. Okay, he has Jupiter in the first house. He was um, the wealthiest um, wrestler in all of wrestling. Jupiter rules wealth. Gentlemanly behavior, okay, is Jupiter. Having a good positive disposition is Jupiter. Jupiter also rules abundance and Jupiter also rules flatulence, okay, or passing gas. And um, yeah, and it's funny. Yeah, Holly, birth chart version of the Uno Reverso. Yeah, for the Libra Risings. And um, I thought that was so funny. My Vedic astrology teacher mentioned that. And, and my Vedic astrology teacher was like, yeah, Jupiter rules flatulence and I was like huh and I thought about it and I was like no I get it like if you're stuffing yourself and overeating and having tons of food that's what's gonna happen um I mean it's a natural thing but like it's kind of interesting because Andre the Giant a lot of people told stories about um how like he would at times like purposely like let one rip and it would go on and on and on and everyone would be like passing out and he'd be like passing gas anyway I don't want to go I won't go too much into it you guys but I think it was um funny or good fun or everyone liked it or I don't know if everyone liked it I don't think everyone liked it but I think it was something that he did and um I, you know, he's also a sun in Taurus, which look at, he's got the sun, Mercury in the part of fortune in Taurus. And, you know, the guy, he liked food. He liked dining out. He even owned a restaurant um, in France for a while, or not in Montreal. He owned a restaurant in Montreal for a while. He liked food. He liked wine. He liked dining. He liked enjoying. He was French after all. And, um, but anyway, um, his friends did tell stories about his epic, like, passing of the gas but anyway guys um that is you guys are like huh natalie but yeah i had to share that with you guys so that is jupiter and um jupiter can give us a good belly laugh as well or kind of like that amusement about life and um when we see the ruler of the first house which is that venus and gemini in the ninth house trying jupiter in the first house um that's where I talked about making the best of a tough situation with the Chiron there with his size and um, all of that like making it's it's tough and it's uncomfortable and it's not easy but he makes the best of it and um, you know what's interesting is the ruler of the first house uh, Venus is in the ninth house of foreign travel and um, because of his size Jupiter and Libra because of his giantism and his size, he gets to travel and see the world. So he goes to, he's been to almost, in an interview, he said he's been to pretty much every country except for like the communist countries is what he was saying, I think. And so he's like been everywhere. And um, for like a poor kid from, you know, an immigrant family growing up on a farm in France to like go from that to traveling the entire world like that is pretty epic and um, just alone of having the ruler of the first house in the ninth house could indicate especially trying Jupiter um, you know having good luck while traveling making money while traveling um, you know having success while traveling especially with the north node there in Rahu and um, Holly says, I'm interested to see how Mars plays with the bone marrow density given his Mars plays Mars placement. Yeah, we are going to um, and and I think it's also the Saturn that we want to look at because Saturn has to do with the bones. But um, Mars does have to. But Mars, particularly in Leo, um, inflammation of the heart or um swelling of the heart which I do think you know he did have because of his disease he did have inflammation swelling of the heart issues with the heart so we will be talking about that um, but talk about you know a guy who is in a lot of ways blessed with some really positive karma of having the ruler of the first house trying Jupiter in the ninth house like travel see the world go everywhere um, ruler of the first house in the ninth travels all over lives overseas in the u.s 
Um, he sets up a farm with friends in North Carolina. And um, it's interesting because even though he moves to the U.S. and he's traveling all over, he does set up a farm in North Carolina, which, like I mentioned, he grew up in a farm in France. And I think it's funny that um, he does have his son in Taurus. So there is this very pastoral, quiet, peaceful living on a farm, close to nature, that very Taurus side of him that he never quite ever gets rid of even though he's jet setting all over the world and wrestling and traveling and doing all this and um it's funny because in the interviews people mentioned that there were like two sides to andre which is very venus and gemini ruling the ascendant like two sides to to andre where one he was like traveling all over and wrestling and in the in the ring and Er, and you know I'm gonna get you and all of that and being really tough and strong Mars Pluto but there was also this other side of him um, with the sun in Taurus where he could live like a very chill like living on the farm living out in nature like a very chill lifestyle a very quiet and chill lifestyle and so um, yeah so I think there were like two sides to him and there, that farm side of him that he grew up with never really kind of like left him. And I think it kind of brings back that old adage of no matter like where you go in the world, there you are type of a thing. Um, anyway, so that is that. Now, um, I think, you know, it's interesting too because uh, the third house does have to do, the third and the ninth house both have to do with travel. And you can see the ruler of the ninth house, which is this Mercury in Taurus, is square the Mars. So uncomfortable situations while traveling. And then also the ruler of the third house, which also represents travel, is square the Saturn. So um, both planets which represent travel um, in his chart, the rulers of the third house and the rulers of the ninth house, are both square to malefics in the chart which to me also talks about um, his uncomfortable feelings while traveling, like bodily uncomfortable feelings, where he would, um, you know, like get made fun of, or they'd try to charge him extra at the hotels because he was too big, or the beds were too small and he couldn't fit in the beds. Um, you know, just like traveling, it wasn't necessarily, like no taxis would come to pick him up, basically, his friend who was smaller would go have to wave down the taxi and then Andre would pop out of nowhere and try to get in the taxi and the taxi would just take off like I'm not taking you anywhere and so he you know there are these issues when traveling or these um, hurdles and limitations and challenges um, because of his size that he does need to get over while traveling but at the same time he does an awful lot of traveling with the ruler of the first house in the ninth house okay and um, anyway so we also I want to talk a little bit more about this Chiron as well and Holly this comes back to your point where you're talking about using like social situation as a buffer to kind of get away from the pain and embarrassment so, like having friends around and I do think that that is very Chiron and Libra like very very and um, you know Chiron in the first house also sometimes when we see Chiron in the first house we can see someone who has like a physical disability or has a physical limitation um, and you know the first house does have to do with our appearance as well particularly in a sign like Libra which can sometimes you know as a Venus ruled sign can have to do with appearances and the way things look and kind of you know feeling doubts about the way that one looks or um, like we talked about like Chiron indicating the wound where we feel like people are picking on us or bullying us because of that and um, but Chiron can also indicate like a physical health injury and um you know, in the sign of Libra too, because Libra is associated with the hormones as Libra is ruled by Venus and it is associated with hormones, etc. And um, 
you know, just the problem with the pituitary gland and the hormones in his body with that Chiron and Libra kind of changing his appearance in the way that people perceive him. I do think that Chiron and Libra there is is quite important. And like we said, it's with Jupiter, so he turns it to his advantage and makes money off of it. But it's still not easy. And um, I also think he neglected his body a lot. And, um, you know, like he was, so he got diagnosed um, when he first went to Japan is when he got diagnosed with his giantism. And they could have given him medicine to help him, but he basically said, if this is the way that God made me, then this is the way I'm supposed to be. He was also, you know, traveling and making money off of it in his size and treating his medical condition may have meant that he wouldn't get, you know, the wrestling gigs that he was getting and he wouldn't get to travel and he would just be like a normal guy then. Um, but doctors were telling him, you know, eventually down the road like this, you won't live a full lifetime because your heart is going to enlarge and it, the stress on your bones and your heart, like, you know, eventually you will pass, you know, because of your disease if you don't kind of work on it. But Chiron can be where we're either, you know, healing a wound or it could be also where we are purposely neglecting ourselves or purposely neglecting a wound and I think for him it was and I'm not saying he was doing it just to make money or whatever but you know his who knows all the reasons but it's very Neptunian with the Neptune and Libra um, conjunction his ascendant the way he would talk about it in almost a spiritual way like if God, you know, wanted to make me this size, then I would be this size type of a thing. And I'm not going to really do anything to change that. And some people could look at that as like neglecting, you know, yourself. And Chiron could definitely show up, I think, in cases of medical neglect. Um, I also think the moon shows up with medical neglect because the moon in astrology really does have to do um, with our body and our health and you know are we taking care of our bodies are we nurturing our bodies are we you know like putting time and effort into taking care of our physical avatar which has to do with the moon and do we put a lot of um, you know some people put a lot of stock into taking care of their physical avatar and some people kind of just thrash their physical avatar and don't really care and, you know, with the Neptune rising and the drinking, which, you know, he could have been doing to manage the pain, you know, we will say that. But I also think with the moon in Capricorn in particular, the moon is in detriment in Capricorn and it is square his ascendant and it is square his Neptune. So I do think that there was a neglecting of the practical realities of his body and what his body needed maybe. And it kind of points out to how he was raised because even when he was a kid, if he would have had, you know, if his parents would have had more money, if he would have had more access to medical care, you know, he lived in a village of 30 people. He, he grew up on a farm with poor immigrant parents. Like there just wasn't resources for that. And I think the moon and Capricorn, um, you know, like for a lot of people who grow up in a family, right? Like, the moon is our family and like for a lot of people that grow up moon and Capricorn could talk about maybe growing up in a family that has restriction on resources or has restrictions on what it can offer right especially when it's square the ascendant like which represents our physical avatar and our body it's like the family doesn't have the practicalities and the resources moon and detriment and Capricorn to really help him care for his body or to really help him take care of his body and some of his friends said that you know he hardly ever went to the doctor he never went to the dentist like you know that's kind of like the neglecting of the self or the neglecting of the body but I also think like poor kids and people who grew up in these you know immigrant you know immigrant families you know I grew up poor for instance I didn't grow up with a lot of money and you know, there wasn't a lot of money for going to the dentist or going to the doctor or even taking time off work to see if there's anything wrong with your body. Like when you grow up in those situations, and I think that that's very moon and Capricorn of like, 
you know, this is the practical realities and we just don't have the time, the money, the effort to put into your like physical avatar. And I think it can create a, a sense of neglecting the body. And I think, you know, that was something that happened with him. And um, Holly says here, it makes sense that he'd want a quiet grounding place as much as air as he has in his chart. Definitely, especially with the Venus in Gemini with Rahu, like in the ninth house, traveling everywhere, meeting all these people, signing autographs, talking to everyone, always on the move. But then his Taurus nature needing quiet, peace, and all of that. And um, yeah, Holly says, keeping in mind that he was born less than a year after World War II ended in France, no less. Yeah, yeah, it was a time of rebuilding and healing. And um, you're exactly right, Holly, like about him being born um, a year after World War II, which is more like, you know, we just got to suck it up and do whatever because we're in the middle of a war, right? So he was born at the end of that, and, you know, there just wasn't the resources. Like, I don't think his parents really understood his disease. I don't think they really knew, per, per se, what was going on too much. And, um, and I think maybe it did lead to a pattern of self-neglect. And sometimes, you know, with Chiron, that can very much be a thing of self-neglect. It can also be where... We're healing and we're rebuilding and we're taking care of ourselves, but it can also on the flip side be a place where there is neglect going on. And I kind of wondered that with the moon and Capricorn square his ascendant, um, if there was neglect of his physical health growing up, you know, never seeing a dentist, never going to the doctor. And the moon is all about our habits. And if our habits instill within us, our family habits instill within us a um, pattern of not taking care of our own needs and not taking care of our body and things like that then when we grow to be older we don't put a whole lot of emphasis on it then either you know and there wasn't a way about Andre the Giant too where I think he kind of realized because of his giantism he wasn't really gonna live forever so it's like okay let's eat drink and be merry you know son and Taurus let's eat drink and be merry um, and spend time with friends and things like that. So um, I did want to point that out because I think that it's very key. Um, and, you know, the moon is ruling his 10th house of career. So, you know, certainly his career. Now, keep in mind, when we think of the sign Capricorn, we think of the bones, we think of the joints, we think of um, the knees, for instance. And um, so with that moon and Capricorn squaring his ascendant, he did have a ton of problems with his bones, his joints, and he did have multiple knee surgeries. And um, just to be able to get into the ring and wrestle and work around his physical limitations, because at one point he, as a wrestler, he it hurt for him to even walk. He was walking with a cane at one point. And so his physical avatar really got beat up because of his work. The other thing I also wondered too is he was just a kid when he left his family to go live on the road and be a wrestler. I wondered if he missed his mom, you know, with the moon and Capricorn in the fourth house square his ascendant. Like, you know, I wondered if he missed his family and his mom and his brother and sister and, and his friends from his hometown. I mean, it's kind of sad in a way when – um, you know, he has to basically leave everything and leave everything behind and um, go off on his own at a very, very young age, which is kind of scary to just have to go do that. At I think he was like 14 years old when he did that. Like that is really, really young. And, you know, um, actually, I think he might have been more like 16, but still that is young. And you know, to always be away from your family because of your career, okay, moon and Capricorn representing the 10th house square, your ascendant, to always have to be away from your family or to always have to be away um, because of your career, especially when you're that young, it's like, I miss my mommy, you know, I'm sure I felt bad when I saw that. I was like, oh, that's so sad, you know, um, but I do think that there is, is that or missing mommy's nurturing or missing mommy's love. And it's like with the moon in Capricorn, there's no time for mommy's love or mommy's nurturing or anything like that. And perhaps, you know, he got that out of being social with people or drinking or, 
you know, with the Neptune there, like it helped him deal with that. But I wondered about his emotional nature with the moon and Capricorn in the fourth house, very sensitive, but also having to be very practical and suck it up and kind of like trudge on with things, you know, um, which is very moon and Capricorn. Um, and um, the other thing that I wanted to note, too, is that how I explained earlier how the moon and Saturn are exchanging signs. Basically, Saturn is in the moon sign and the moon is in Saturn sign. And um, Saturn actually rules the fourth house of family. Now, what's interesting is Saturn and the fourth house in astrology. So both Saturn and the fourth house have been associated with landowners, farmers, um, people who farm the land, people who till the land, people who do, you know, back, uh, back breaking work in the fields. Like that is very fourth house or Saturn, okay? And, um, or Saturn in the fourth or Saturn and the fourth house, just definitely having to do with farming and farmland. Now, when we see the ruler of the fourth house in the 10th house, that can indicate that, you know, a person's going to go into the family business. Now, the family business was basically the farm or farming the land. And because Andre was so big, he could do the work of three different, you know, men. He's strong like bull, sun and Taurus. He's strong like bull, like an ox, and he can do the work of three men. And because he has the ruler of the fourth house of family in his 10th house of career, I think there was an expectation from his father in particular who expected him to go work on the family farm and take over the family farm. Now, um, he did that. He quit school at 14 years old and he went to go work on the family farm. Um, but he kept telling his dad, like, dad i um and like somebody rode into their village with a really nice car at one point and he looked at his dad and he said dad someday i'm gonna have a nice car like that and his dad looked at him and goes you know quit dreaming and keep walking <laughs> and that's a very moon and capricorn like you know um neptune rising dreaming like quit dreaming and keep walking is what his father told him that's also very you know saturn and cancer or you know ruler of the fourth house in the tenth house my father expects me to go along the lines of the family business even with the moon in the tenth house the ruler of the tenth house in the fourth house like my father wants me to be in the family business and take over the family business or work in it which he tried to do but he hated it okay moon and capricorn ruler of the 10th house square his ascendant he hated the family business and not hated it that might be strong but he really disliked it um and he could have found it you know moon and capricorn square the ascendant he could have found the family uh farm like very depressing very like droll very much like the same thing every day very like hard back-breaking labor on the farm like just not what he wanted and when you look at the ruler of his ascendant um as being venus and gemini in the ninth house like trying to get him to sit still or be in one place it's like no he's not just gonna sit on the family farm forever and like work on the family farm and had he done that that would have made him unhappy and with that moon squaring his ascendant i think his unhappiness about not following his dreams neptune rising caused him to leave home and um he told his father when he left home if i don't make any money i'll never be back which you know is very ruler of the second house of money with pluto that's a very extreme attitude to have about money like i'm never if if i don't if i leave home and i never come home again moon and capricorn square the ascendant um, if I'm not successful, then I will never come home again if I don't make money. Luckily, he did make money, so he did get to go home again. So he let him, his father didn't tell him that, though. He told himself that, like, if I don't make money, I will never go home. And um, so I just think that that is very interesting with the moon and Saturn and the way that they're exchanging signs and in each other's houses. There is something about a farm there. Now, um, and the family business and the family farm and how it made him miserable and how he didn't like it.
Now, what's interesting is when he came over to the United States, he did start like a farm with his friends, um, which, you know, which is interesting because the 11th house ruler is the son, which is my friends are trying my farm. OK, so sun and Taurus trines or not trine sextile Saturn. OK, so my friends are sextile my fourth house of my land and farming. So he would have his friends take care of his land in North Carolina on his little mini farm that he had there. I don't know if it was that mini, but he would have his friends take care of his farm. And I think that's very ruler of the 11th house, trying Saturn, which is the ruler of the fourth house. And as we know, you know, farming is closely associated with Saturn and the fourth house in general. And so it's funny because even though he goes so far across the world to escape the farm lifestyle or whatever, he ends up still doing the farming with his friends in some type of a way, um, which again goes back to the Taurus concept of like doing the same thing that you already know. Um, so I think that that's interesting about the moon and the farming and the father and um, we also see like in in the type of astrology that i practice in renaissance astrology the fourth house is associated with the father and the foundation of the chart um and so we can see that saturn is in a square to his jupiter which to me just says like the ruler of my fourth house is squaring my jupiter which says like my father is doubting me or is doubting um, whether I can actually do this, but his doubting Andre the Giant is actually what propels him to try to go out into the world and try to make something of himself. So I think that that is um, very interesting too. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit about the um, medical issues also to like look at Jupiter in the chart as being the opportunities that we have or the good things that we have but his ruler of his fourth house of family is squaring that Jupiter so it's like my opportunities in life are limited because of my family so I can't really stay with my family all right moon and Capricorn square the ascendant but I miss my family at the same time or it's sad that I can't be with my family because of my career so there's this whole kind of you know mess in his chart around that issue and around the issue of um, his father like doubting him and feeling like uh yeah you're not like i don't think you can go do that or i don't you know but also just the limited opportunities of where he grew up uh, ruler of the fourth house square his jupiter like living in a town of 30 people in a village um, with immigrants is like you know an immigrant village is like limiting his opportunities to go and see the world which is what he wants to do with the venus and gemini in the ninth house okay so that's some pretty intense astrology right there and i think it's interesting and um one thing i also want to point out too is because saturn is the ruler of the fourth house of the foundation and Saturn is also associated with our skeleton and our bones and, you know, holding up the frame of our body. It is in a square to this Jupiter kind of saying it's hard for my bones and my foundation and, and my bones and my body to hold up this Jupiter frame, this Jupiter body that I have. And um, what's interesting in astrology is we have something called um, like a superior square or an inferior square, and it is a way to further break down aspects. And in this case, Saturn is in the superior position to Jupiter in that it is overcoming Jupiter. So those, you know, issues and limitations having to do with his largeness and his you know where he was born and um, the doubts of his father like all of that is in a that Saturn is making a superior square to that Jupiter and is overcoming that Jupiter um, but at the same time it's not ruining everything for him because um, Jupiter and Saturn are both in each other's exalted signs and helping each other out there and also Saturn is the insect malefic so it doesn't 
ruin everything for him. He still gets to live to 46 years old and gets to live out his dream, but there is a big drag um, on supporting all of that Jupiterian, you know, largeness. There's a huge drag on his skeleton, on his knees, on the foundation of his body, like everything. There's a huge drag in the sense that his bones have a hard time carrying all of that weight. And um, so I think that that's also a very interesting thing. And um, let's see, what else did I want to talk about too? Um, let's go ahead, now that I'm into the Saturn-Jupiter stuff, I want to start going into the medical issues. Um, so as I mentioned, Saturn is overcoming Jupiter and is in a is in the superior position and is making a superior square to Jupiter, which just means Saturn energy is overcoming that Jupiter. Um, so what ends up happening is that he ends up having um, not only like, you know, excess growth hormone issues, but he also, you can see like his, because um, Jupiter rules the pituitary gland, the liver, um, diabetes, like all of that is associated with Jupiter. And we can see Saturn is overpowering Jupiter and is creating issues in, in those areas of his body. And um, yeah, so, but at the same time, he's able to still live to 46 years old because Saturn is the insect malefic and they are exchanging signs. So they are in a mutual reception there, Saturn and Jupiter, but he still has extreme limitations and extreme, extreme pressure from Saturn put on his liver, um, his pituitary gland, um, his bones, the, um, the incorrect functioning of his pituitary gland is also um, as a result of that Saturn, I believe as well, like the incorrect functioning of his pituitary gland. So we do see that um, as a result of the medical astrology. But what's interesting is what actually ends up, and I imagine too, because of all the drinking and everything, I imagine his liver was also not in the best, um, you know, position either. And Saturn overcoming Jupiter, you know, liver problems, um, you know, corrosis of the liver. Like, I don't know how bad it was with the liver problems but I'm again because of the drinking I'm wondering like there probably was liver issues there so he did have all of that um, with the Saturn issues with the bones and supporting his large frame and all of that but what ends up really kind of taking him out in the end as I mentioned earlier is the Mars and Leo um, which is the out of sect malefic in a conjunction with Pluto and square Mercury and um, he stops breathing in the middle of the night and has um, goes into cardiac arrest and it's a heart attack that ends up taking him out and um, so we can see you know with the Mars and Leo um, and you know that Mars and Leo is not being helped out by that Mercury either because Mercury is in Taurus in the sign of uh, Mars's detriment and that Mercury is in a uh, superior square to Mars and is overtaking that Mars. So that Mercury isn't really helping that Mars either. And um, it's interesting because at the time when he died, he was living in the U.S. So he was in Paris when he died. So essentially he was overseas when he died, ruler of the ninth house in the eighth house, square the Mars in Leo. He was overseas while he died. And, um, you know, he probably shouldn't have been traveling at that time. And, you know, basically like Mercury controls um, the, you know, the Mars has to do with our muscles. And in Leo, it has to do with the, the muscle of the heart. But Mercury is what is animating and causing um, you know, the heart to animate, which is the motion. And so you can see that the heart just stopped and um, he actually died. I believe he died in his sleep, which is also, you know, Mercury is ruling the 12th house of sleep and in the eighth house there of death. And so you can see he has a heart attack while he's sleeping at night. 
um, in a foreign country, basically, where um, he's traveling away from home. And you, so you can really kind of see the death aspect of what happened to him. Now, in medical astrology, um, Leo does rule the heart, the spine, and the eyes primarily. And um, he had major problems with his heart and his spine. Um, I didn't hear anything about his eyes, but basically, you know, having the greatest malefic in his chart in Leo, um, you know, tells us, you know, making an aspect to that Mercury in the eighth house does tell me that it's like, okay, he's got, um, you know, like there could be issues with the spine or the heart that kind of does him in at the end of the day. And that is what did him in pretty much at the end of the day. Um, I also think the Mercury and Taurus to square the Mars because normally like in charts when you see more Mercury square Mars that can be somebody who like can really pop off um, at the mouth and can really like say really cutting things at times but I don't with the Mercury but the Mercury and Taurus is actually like a lot slower and um, you know thankfully is calmer and slower so I don't think he was as much like popping off and I actually don't think he was known for like shit talking in the ring I don't think he was much of a shit talker and keep in mind English was his second language and also that people had a tendency to say that he would speak very slowly which is Mercury and Taurus and at times he would give like kind of short one word answers to things which is very Mercury and Taurus square Mars to kind of give short one word answers to things but then people would think that he was mad at them when he was kind of giving those short one word answers so you can see the Mercury square Mars I also think Mercury square Mars especially because Mercury rules the ninth house of travel is talking about his problems and issues and difficulties while traveling like he still likes it he still enjoys it Venus in the ninth house but there is like issues with the logistics he can't get a cab easily he can't find a bed that fits him easily like there is problems with it and um, one thing I can say about Taurus is uh, particularly that have a lot of heat in their chart or have a lot of Leo in their chart they do not like to be crowded and um I know for sure because like my boyfriend's a Leo rising and he also has a bunch of Taurus in his chart and I'll tell you guys when he's in a big crowd of people and he's he's tall he's very tall and um you know but and he's probably I don't know he's probably 200 pounds he's not a huge guy but he's tall and you know a little stocky but it's like when he's in a public space he hates it when people crowd him like he cannot stand it he goes off like I mean he doesn't scream at people or yell at people but I can see like the steam coming out of his head like it's like oh my god and I have to wonder like people talked about how Andre the Giant hated being crowded and if you can imagine a Taurus person with um, their Taurus planet square Leo which of course Leo brings a lot of heat and like you know being in a cramped place like being in a cramped elevator in Japan with like tons of people would just I, I don't think he would say anything uh, I don't think Andre the Giant would go off or say anything but you could just probably feel the irritation coming from him because I it's one thing I do know is Taurus people do not like to be crowded in any type of a way like they need space around them and then you also add Leo into the mix with getting overheated and getting hot easily. Like, ugh, it's not a good combination. Um, so I think that that's very funny. And I also think the Mercury and Taurus square Mars and Leo is very much like what you would expect kind of from a giant. Like, you know, giants, they're not always very like talkative. They're not talking all the time. They're not, you know, maybe known for being insanely clever, but they and they may be kind of like slow to anger or slow with their words at times but with the mercury square mercury and taurus square mars you could see like 
an anger building or like him getting very like silent and not saying anything and then people going oh like is he gonna freaking explode like you know that's a very giant thing to just kind of have a giant sitting around playing cards but then all of a sudden is up like flipping tables and and rampaging through the house like I feel that's a very giant a person that's a giant I feel that's kind of a giant thing <laughs> but um yeah that'll clear <laughs> exactly holly enter the flatulence enter the <laughs> there is a story about him being in japan and in a tiny little elevator they just kept letting more people in and more people in and um they said he turned and he winked at someone and then he like passed gas really loudly and everybody just was like left the elevator <laughs> but anyway um I just think that that is very, and you could see people because with the Mercury and Taurus in the eighth house, I wonder if he would get quiet sometimes when he's thinking or talk slower or communicate more slowly, Mercury and Taurus, but then people wondering like, is he about to explode? Is he mad? Is he, you know, so I think that that could be something that maybe people could get afraid of. Although he doesn't really seem like the type of guy who is just flipping tables and going off on people. But, you know, everyone does have a temper. So I wonder, or for everyone has anger, right? So I wonder if he would just get really quiet when he'd get mad and, and if people would start to get nervous when he got quiet. I'm, I'm, best, I'm guessing, yeah. And as Holly would say, yeah, if you let, enter the flatulence, that will clear the space quickly. Yep, for sure. And um, anyway, so I think and I, I also think it's funny with the Mercury and Taurus, like a lot of people were like, oh, is he like not very bright or is he slower or something like that? But it's not that the guy spoke multiple languages and he did have a funny, clever, jokey kind of a side to him. But I also think people would ask him the same questions all the time over and over in interviews. And you could, even on the David Letterman interview, he you could tell he was starting to get annoyed because he was only giving one-word answers. And um, it was kind of making David Letterman uncomfortable. And so, yeah, you've got that Mercury-Mars tension there. And um, anyway, I do want to talk about the Mars-Pluto as well. So, um, you know... And one thing I noticed right away, of course, like a wrestler who's known for their showmanship and the dramatics of wrestling and professional wrestling um, and just the like body slamming and the, you know, the very competitive, like I'll body slam you type of energy. That's very Mars Pluto. And when I saw that he had Mars Pluto in the 11th house, Mars Pluto in astrology does indicate, can indicate super powerful like superhuman strength and particularly in the sign of leo it's like i like showing off my superhuman strength you know and um, when you put it in the 11th house it's also very much like and the crowd roars and because the 11th house is where we find like our supporters and our people that are clapping for us and you know it's so funny because he has that mars pluto and leo conjunction um in the 11th house and here's how i wrote it down i wrote he's a huge star okay mars pluto and leo he enters the ring he performs in a massive arena to thunderous applause showing off his brute strength right mars pluto and um and to thunderous applause and people going, yeah, you know, because he's like body slamming and throwing people around. And that's very Mars Pluto, like in Leo, like I'm going to show off my brute strength and I'm also going to get the crowd like really riled up to see and the crowd like really, really pumped up, like, you know, in the Leo aspect of it for a total smackdown like you know the crowd is roaring and I've got them all pumped up and the crowd's going crazy and now I'm gonna smack these people down Mars Pluto right so when I saw that in the chart I'm like I started to wonder like do all professional wrestlers have Mars Pluto probably not maybe some of them have squares or oppositions or whatever but I was like Mars Pluto definitely in Leo and um he was a driving force in the 
um, sport of wrestling in general. And um, just to read you a couple of things about Mars Pluto. So Mars Pluto can stand for superhuman power, great people in the sphere of sport, okay? People who are very notable and um, achieve a lot in the area of sports. And Mars Pluto can also indicate people who proceed in a brutal manner, but it can also indicate exceptional ability in sport and war injuries. Now he had a lot of quote unquote war injuries from doing wrestling, like he messed up his back, which is definitely um, Leo stuff. The Leo rules the back. And so, um, you know, he messed up his back a lot. He had issues with his back because of the body slamming and the picking people up. And of course it puts a lot of pressure on your back to do that. But, you know, running all that extreme power and force through his veins like there's pictures of him like picking up cars picking up four people at the same time so of course he has mars pluto and leo of course he does and he's a famous wrestler and he has superhuman strength and um i was like yeah that totally makes sense um he also as i mentioned earlier is in the guinness book of world record for being the highest paid wrestler um in all of wrestling as of that time and um he you'll you'll note here that mars also rules the second house of money this the ruler of the second house of money is in the 11th house of profit with pluto that is an extreme rags to riches story right there pluto oftentimes indicates riches or rags to riches or riches to rags, one of the two, but extreme changes in his financial situation, ruler of the second house in the 11th house of profit. Now, um, in Vedic astrology, the, the second house, ruler of the second house in the 11th house is a wealth yoga, is a planetary um, position that indicates wealth. And so, um, we would say ruler of the second house Mars in the 11th house of profit and acquisition is a wealth yoga. Now, on top of that, he has Jupiter rising, which is the best planet in his chart by sect, trying the ruler of his ascendant, the Venus Jupiter. He also has Venus Rahu, which is another wealth signature. But I also really look at that, um, you know, extreme money making ruler of the second house and he makes his money through his brute power his brute strength and through the cheering thunderous applause of body slamming people you know and um yeah that's beautiful astrology right there and it does show his extreme attitude around money too and his pride around money because remember he told his father like i will not come home if i don't make any money like you'll see me again if i make money the ruler of the second house with pluto in the 11th house of profit and success and in the sign of leo which you know does have a certain level of ambition and pride attached to the sign of leo and so he took that very seriously and he ended up being one of the like top billing wrestlers and performers out there and um so i think that that is very interesting now one thing that they one challenge that he had is that um, the ruler of the ninth house, which represents travel and moving around, travel, going different places, is square his money planet. So how I would read that is I would read that as the second house ruler is square the ruler of the ninth house of travel. So he has to travel around in order to make money. And if he stays in one place too long for too much of a time, people the novelty wears off you know like he would go and he'd be in Canada for a while but then he would stay there for too long and the novelty would wear off and so they kept having to move him around and move him around um, because he is like a special attraction wrestler and people want to see a giant and they want to see a giant body slam another guy right and so like after they've seen that a couple times though it's like well what else is there to see right and so 
it did affect his money in the sense that he always had to be moving around and he always had to be traveling in order to make money. And um, that is stressful, you know, especially since traveling was so challenging for him anyway. I mean, he said the airplane was fine because he would be in first class and he found ways around it. But I mean, he did explain that, yeah, it could be very challenging at time, times for him to travel and um, the novelty would kind of wear off wherever he was. So he'd have to go to another place to kind of find more novelty. And, um, you know, Venus and Gemini, of course, is all about, you know, novelty or selling novelty, especially um, Venus being the planet of our looks and how we look, right? So I think his chart is amazing. I think he lived his chart to an absolute T. And um, yeah, so I also want to, so let's go ahead, after talking about the Mars, I want to go ahead and move on to the Venus-Rahu conjunction. And as we know, Rahu in astrology represents the North Node, and um, his Venus is in a conjunction with the North Node. Now, earlier I talked about he had him having this special destiny, particularly around the way that he looks. And... Um, you know, because Venus does have to do with our appearance and how we look. And it's also the ruler of his ascendant, which is also having to do with, you know, how we look and how we look in the world. And so him having a special destiny to fulfill around that. And, um, you know, I mentioned earlier how he told his dad, hey, dad, if I don't make any money, I'm not coming home as a point of pride okay ruler of my second house of money conjunction pluto and leo as a matter of pride if i don't make any money at this i'm not coming home okay his dad thought he was going to be back home in a couple of weeks but what he didn't realize is that his son had a special destiny to fulfill with the venus rahu conjunction in the ninth house that would take him all over the world and so um yeah, so he had a special destiny to travel all over the world and meet tons of people, okay? Venus in the sign of Gemini. And his father, like, really didn't know what a low tolerance his son had for, you know, sitting in one place and waiting for something to happen, which is very Taurus, you know? So I'm not saying he doesn't have that aspect of him where maybe he would feel comfortable, like, waiting in one place, waiting for something to happen. But at the end of the day, he felt this very strong pull to achieve his destiny. And that is very like ruler of the first house with Rahu. Now, keep in mind that Rahu, especially Rahu in the ninth house, can indicate fame as the ninth house is a house of um, destiny, special destiny, luck, um, good fortune. Like the ninth house is the good things that we're getting in this lifetime as a result of the positive things that we did in past lives. And so having the ruler of his ascendant there with Rahu tells me that, you know, he does have a special destiny that includes expanding his mind, traveling all over the world, meeting new people. Like there is a special element there for him. And um, it is a part of his destiny. Now, um, I do have one other point that I want to try to sneak in here before I keep talking about, you know what, I think I'm going to save it because we are on the Venus Rahu because don't let me forget to talk about his Taurus sun at 27 degrees Taurus because I am going to talk about that. But I want to keep going on the Venus Rahu in Gemini here in the ninth house because we're on it. Um, we should know that um, Venus, Rahu, or the North Node is very well placed in Gemini. Like Rahu does like to be in Gemini. And K2, its opposite, or the South Node, does like to be in Sagittarius too, particularly in the ninth and third house. So that's a very strong position for the nodes. Now, it's not great for relationships and for quote unquote settling down. Now, keep in mind, Venus is the planet of relationships and. Um, because Andre the Giant was always traveling and going places and like he was traveling 320 days out of the year, that is not really conducive to having a relationship. 
And um, we can also see Uranus is there too. So there's a lot of like quick, fast relationships um, that perhaps you would get into or maybe girls he'd hook up with or because women liked him. That was the other thing. Like they said, they go, oh, he has um, his ring his ring, ring finger is a size 24. Like what does that tell you, ladies? Wink, wink, right? Like that type of thing. So um, with Venus and Gemini, there was probably a side to him that was kind of a flirt that liked variety. But I also feel like his lifestyle of jet setting and globe trotting and going everywhere isn't really conducive to having a continuous relationship or settling down. Now, he did end up having a child with a woman um, that he was with for a while, but for most of his life, he was going around traveling, um, meeting different people like his life just not really conducive to that and so I will say that even though Rahu is very well placed in Gemini and K2 is very well placed in Sagittarius now I think it's interesting with his K2 in Sagittarius because um, or south node in Sagittarius because it makes me feel that perhaps in a past life he did travel around a lot or he lived a life of a nomad and to come into this lifetime and not really want to stay in your village of three thirty people and go and see the rest of the world because perhaps in a past life you were a nomad, you know, and I could see him like in a past life being like, you know, a sheep farmer or something like that and like taking his, um, I don't know what you call, a, it's not a flock of sheep, but you know what I mean? You know how farmers like, hundreds of years ago would be nomadic and would go all over the place with their families and like travel all over um I feel like perhaps he had a past life like that which prepared him in some way for this lifetime of traveling all over because it seemed very natural to him in a lot of ways and to grow up on a on a farm with in a village of 30 people and to just kind of naturally like flow into traveling in this lifetime and enjoy it and be easy about it is kind of unusual and so it makes me feel that perhaps in a past life he did travel or he did have some type of a nomadic lifestyle and um i wondered too if perhaps he had a nomadic lifestyle that had to do with a sibling in a past life what i find very interesting that in this particular lifetime he did travel with his best friend named Tim White who is like a brother to him and actually cried when he realized that Andre died in Paris when he wasn't there with him and he cried about it and you could tell that Tim White like saw Andre as a brother and they were really like best friends and I wonder if those two like you know maybe they were brothers in a past life and they traveled together I mean we don't know we have no way of knowing but for those two to kind of like fit together so easily and travel everywhere together i i think there is something key about that um and you know having that support like of a brother or a friend along with you is a big deal and um yeah for a for a guy that grew up in a village of 30 people he like embraced traveling and going everywhere like it was a second skin like you know, I think it's pretty interesting that, um, pretty remarkable that this big guy who had a hard time fitting into things saw the entire world with his best friend. Like, that is so, you know, Rahu in the ninth house and K2 in the third house. Like, it is so in, in Gemini and Sagittarius. Like, that is very on point there. And, um, yeah. And, you know, with the Venus in Gemini, with Rahu in the third house, it's about being on the move all the time, but opening his mind to his dreams and visions of, of his life and what he wants. The ninth house is very connected to our dreams and our visions that we have for ourselves. And um, his ability with Venus there to get comfortable with that right away and with Uranus there too to live with the changes and the ups and downs of everything like I, I think that's a very curious and interesting thing um, and um, with Venus and Gemini with Rahu it was hard for him to work into a settled relationship like I mentioned 
Um, he, he had a lot of friends and people that he met, but it was really hard for him to be in one relationship. And, um, you know, it's interesting with the Venus in the ninth house of good fortune, luck, and destiny into a trine with his Jupiter, which is the um, insect benefic in his chart. Like, I do think that talks about him having some very positive karma from a past life that helps him to achieve his dreams in this lifetime that, that make him... Um, Oh, thank you, Holly. Holly said you've done a great job honoring his legacy, Nat. Oh, well, you thank you, Holly. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think um, I think he had some blessed karma, you know, from a past life. Maybe it was making sacrifices for family. Maybe it was traveling or always being gone. Or um, maybe in a past life, it was one of his brothers that was gone and he had to stay back with the family. And in this lifetime, he gets to go. It's interesting because his brother in the video of him talks about how, um, you know, like he missed him and he's, he'll always be his brother and he, he missed him his whole life. Like you could tell there was a sadness in his brother that he didn't get to be like that Andre left and then he didn't really get to be around him that much anymore. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting thing when we bring in Rahu and Ketu and we bring in the North and South node. It it really, really kind of helps us look at things from an elevated level. And um, I also just want to mention that Rahu in general is, or the North node right here in Gemini, is associated with um, being an outsider or being a foreigner. So he would travel all over the world, okay? But he was, and he was well loved by people with the Venus there with Rahu, but he also was always like an outsider or a foreigner his whole life. But again, I don't think he like let it bother him too much, or I think he was able just to kind of go with the flow and, and be mutable with the Gemini there and just roll with it, which really did help him. Um, but keep in mind in our chart that the North Node or Rahu signifies the search for self-realization. And Rahu wants to be out searching for new experiences, particularly in the ninth house and particularly in the sign of Gemini. Um, with Rahu and Gemini in the ninth house, there's a need to be a part of something, to never be still, to be independent, to have a love of variety, um, to speak multiple languages, which he did. And, um, you know, somebody that needs freedom in their activities and with Uranus there also taking the path of the unexpected. I also think, you know, in the 1970s and the 1980s, like living a globe trotting lifestyle and traveling all over the place wasn't like, you know, that's a pretty modern thing for the 1970s and the 1980s because back then not many people were taking you know planes as much there wasn't you know there wasn't as much travel there was travel at the time but it just having like a globe trotting lifestyle or like a nomadic lifestyle really wasn't I don't know I mean I grew up in the 80s but it wasn't really I don't think it really was that type of a big I don't think that many people lived like that whereas with him like he definitely kind of lived a very modern lifestyle and when you think about where he came from a small village of 30 people to live such a modern lifestyle to have his mind opened and be traveling everywhere like that is epic when you really think about it and um so i also think you know venus does represent our looks and how we look and with Rahu there, I think it also says something about how his looks or how his appearance is very foreign or unusual looking with the Venus Rahu there. But Venus Rahu is actually, um, in Vedic astrology, is also a wealth signature or can indicate wealth. And so again, and it's trying Jupiter. So we've got multiple signatures in this chart that indicate wealth. The Venus Rahu conjunction in the ninth house of good fortune and good luck, trying Jupiter in the first house. We also have the ruler of the second house in the 11th house of profit, like showing how he makes his money as a wrestler. Like 
you know, with Pluto, the rags to riches planet, like, you know, there are really good signs in this chart that, you know, he was going to be wealthy or he was going to make money. And um, so I think that that is very interesting as well. Now, um, Holly says people didn't definitely travel in their pajamas then. Yeah, like, you know, Holly, yeah, for sure. Like people didn't, I mean, people weren't like digital nomads like back in the 1970s and the 1980s. Like it wasn't a thing then like people are now. And so he was kind of like an early nomad, um, like early adopter. And Uranus oftentimes has to do with people who are like early adopters or early at doing something. And um, so, yeah, I think that that is very interesting about his chart. Now, the last couple of things that I do want to leave you guys with, well, there's two things actually. Um, I want to read you guys a poem at the end, which I think signifies his entire chart. But before I do that, there's a couple of stray little things I want to tie in um, that I haven't had an opportunity to mention. And one is his son at 27 degrees Taurus. Now, I haven't even talked about his son too much except to say um, that it rules his 11th house of friends and it is in a sextile with Saturn. Um, and his friends look over his land or his farm in North Carolina. And we see that positive relationship of him giving those responsible responsibilities to his friends I have responsible friends who watch over my land um, but I haven't talked much about his son in Taurus I just would like to share that um, the sun in Taurus at 27 degrees Taurus is in a conjunction with the fixed star Algol and Algol is located at 26 degrees Taurus. Now, for those of you who are familiar familiar with fixed star Algol, Algol was the associated like with the head of the Medusa. And um, as we know, like Medusa's head like was made of hissing snakes. And if she looked at you, you would turn into stone. And people were afraid to look at Medusa. Now, I think it's really interesting that his son is in a conjunction with Algo because I do think that people would get scared of his appearance. And um, I do think people could be like frightened by him in that same way that people get frightened looking at the face of Medusa, right? And um, that fixed star um, at 26 degrees Taurus, of which his son is in a conjunction with, can indicate like a fearful appearance and you know people kind of being afraid of him because of that and um people being scared of him when they see him and um thank god he was born with all the libra rising and he's just a very gentle giant and all of that so you know but i also wonder too like if, with his son in the eighth house if at times he felt alone or outcasted um you know um I mean, he does have the Venus trying the Jupiter. He's got all of that, too. But you just also have to wonder, like, um, you know, like when he's by himself, what does he really feel like? Or when he's not with his friends and all of that. And um, the eighth house in astrology can do with uh, difficulties in life. So, you know, being born where he was, being born the way he was, a lot of difficulties in life. Um, the eighth house also shows where we need to have a lot of inner power and strength to get through life. And um, especially Sun and Taurus in the eighth house shows where we need to have a lot of resilience in life. And um, we need to be strong and we need to keep going. The eighth house also has to do with entrenched issues and secret diseases. And um, so, you know, that disease, he didn't really know about it for that long. And or he, he didn't know about it until later in life, like what it actually was. And um, it was like this entrenched issue in his life that he had this disease. And, you know, sometimes with the eighth house son, we can feel like we're not really belonging or we're not really like others or we're a freak or a weirdo in some way. And... I do think his with his son being in a conjunction with Algo, there was that fear that like my appearance could scare people. And um, anyway, even though he was like a very gentle giant, 
The other thing I want to mention here, too, um, is not only is his son in a conjunction with the fixed star Algol, but his son is also in a conjunction with the Pallades. And anybody who has Taurus planets at 28 or 29 degrees Taurus, now his son is at 27 Taurus, so it's right there. But anyone that has planets at 28 or 29 Taurus has their particularly your son, is a big deal to have your son in a conjunction with the Pallades. Now, um, he, um, the Pallades in mythology were known as the seven weeping sisters, and they did have to do with the process of loss and grief and going through like loss and grief. And, you know, um, the, the son rules his 11th house of friends and, you know, hearing his friends talk about the loss and grief that they were going through as a result of his death on his documentary was pretty painful like they really looked like they were in pain over the loss of him and um but i think it's interesting too with the pallades because the Pal the pallades also has to do with loving and belonging and feeling um you know and sometimes losing what you love and what you belong to but it does have to do with acceptance and belonging and higher love and all of that and something about his son being in conjunction with the Pallades I think also just says how he wanted to be loved and how he wanted to belong and um yeah and so and also too when you think about the Pallades like the Pallades are associated like with like an alien race now none of us really know if whoa I mean I don't know do we know if there are aliens or not I don't really know do you know what's going on I don't know <laughs> but um you know we talk about like you know star seeds and Palladians and Sirius and you know Syrian star seeds and all of that you know with the with the whole thing of being like an alien or being different but also being a person that is here to spread like love and beauty and belongingness and you know when I think about like and who knows about all of this right but I'm just riffing here but like if there is such a thing as an alien race of Palladians can I could totally imagine there being giants you know and if you think about if there are other alien races out there couldn't you guys imagine like different humanoid forms like people who look different um people who and even when they show photos of like quote unquote what a palladian would look like they're oftentimes very tall over seven feet tall um like an advanced race of people of spiritual beings and i kind of think it's interesting you guys with his son conjunction the palladies and with neptune on his ascendant you know, it kind of makes me think, like, was Andre the Giant like a, um, was he like a Palladian? Was he a, and I may be going too far out there for some of you guys here, but I just have to say it, like, because I could see that if there is such a thing, I could see there being, like, giant Palladians. And I wonder, like, was he a giant Palladian that came to Earth and was here and bringing this, you know, experience to Earth? And... Certainly people that look different and I mean aliens are always kind of feared too because they look different or they're not you know they, they just look different than the rest of us it's weird or it's different or they've got green skin or blue hair or whatever you know like they're they're eight feet tall like I could totally see that and I just think it's kind of interesting that his son is in a conjunction with the Pallades and um, also the fixed star algal so anyway take that for what it's worth take it for a grain of salt but that is kind of what I was seeing now the very last thing that I want to leave you guys with is um, an homage to Venus in Gemini conjunction Rahu or the north node in Gemini I would like to leave you an homage to having Venus in Gemini in the ninth house okay so I am going to go ahead and stop annotating. I'm going to bring up this little poem I have to share for you guys that I think very much embodies the energy of Andre the Giant. And the poem is called, Oh, the Places You Will Go by Dr. Seuss. 
And um, <laughs> can you guys, this is such a Venus in Gemini in the ninth house poem. I'm like, this is it right here. And the poem, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's very long, but just imagine Venus in Gemini in the ninth house while I'm reading this, okay? Oh, the places you will go. Congratulations, today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head and feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You are on your own and you know what you want to know. And you are the guy who will decide where to go. You'll look up and down streets, look them over with care. About some you will say, I don't choose to go there. With your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down any not so good streets. Venus and Gemini in the ninth house, okay? And you may not want to find any, and you'll want to go down. In that case, of course, you'll head straight out of town. It's opener there, in the wide open air. Out there, there are things that can happen and frequently do to people as brainy and footsy as you. And then things start to happen. Don't worry, don't stew. Just go right along. You'll start happening too. Oh, the places you will go. You will be on your way up. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who soar to high heights. You won't lag behind because you'll have the speed. You'll pass the whole gang and you'll soon take the lead. Wherever you fly, you'll be the best of the best. Wherever you go, you will top all the rest. So that is what I am getting for you guys. Hi, Edwina. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad you're catching me live too. Hi, Edwina. I just saw your comment there. And um, I'm just actually right now I'm just closing out the stream on Andre the Giant and his Venus and Gemini in the ninth house conjunction Rahu or the North Node. And um, yeah, it's just so cool. There was an end to that I really liked here. Um, and it says you'll get mixed up, of course, as you already know, you'll get mixed up with many strange birds as you go, Venus and Gemini. So be sure when you step, step with care and great tact. And remember that life is a great balancing act, okay? And of course, that's Libra rising. Life is a great balancing act. Just never forget to be dexterous and deft and never mix up your right foot with your left. And you will succeed. Yes, you will indeed. 98 and 3 fourths percent guaranteed kid you'll move mountains okay so i am reading to you guys oh the places you will go and i think it's so like beneficial and exacting for his chart for the venus and gemini conjunction rahu trying jupiter in the first house oh the places he would go and um yes he did go many different places and yeah i just i love that i love that poem i think it's soothing to the soul and um, life is a great balancing act and as we can see like wherever we go there we are there we are and I think that his chart is very um, representative of like fate and how surprising fate can be at time and yet at the same time there's always that sense of returning to what we know and returning home as well so anyway, thank you all so much for being here. Holly, thank you for your wonderful comment. And um, thank you to everyone for your wonderful comments in general and being engaged with the chart. I really enjoyed presenting this one. I hope you all enjoyed it as well. Thank you very much for being here. If you're interested in supporting my work, please like, share, or subscribe. Share with your friends. Um, you can book natal chart readings with me. There'll be details in the description box below after I get the video up and posted for how to do that. And as always, I hope you all have a wonderful evening and take care. Bye-bye now.